the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. I'm Dan Hurley. On November 4th, Election Day, thousands of voters in Hamilton and Warren counties will walk into their voting booths ready to register their opinions on candidates for governor and Congress, as well as on a variety of local levies and bond issues. But a large percentage will be surprised that they are also expected to cast a vote for a representative from District 4 of the Ohio Board of Education. The Ohio Board of Education uh, creates policy and makes recommendations for K-12 education in the state. The board consists of 19 members, 11 are elected from districts, and 8 are appointed by the governor. The current representative from Hamilton and Warren County, District 4, is Debbie Terhar, who is completing one term and is also president of the board. I am joined now by the candidates for the Ohio Board of Education to represent Hamilton and Warren counties. Pat Patricia Bruns is a retired educator who taught for 30 years in Northwest School District where she taught art and served as the president of the Northwest Association of Teachers. Since retiring in 2004, Ms. Bruns has pursued art including um, the mural program at Artworks, the subject of a recent newsmakers. Zach Haynes is a Republican, the president of the Northeast Hamilton County Republican Club and the party's executive committee. He runs of families janitorial supply business. Mr. Haynes is a graduate of Miami University and lives in Sims Township with his family. Welcome to Newsmakers, both of you. Thank you. I want to start out, Pat, let's start with you. What should schools be preparing children for? And I ask this in light of a lot of discussion about the expensiveness of college and whether or not it's really appropriate. What should, what should schools be preparing children to do? To determine what problems are, how to solve them creatively, critically, how to work in teams, how to be effective communicators, in addition to, of course, um, common um, knowledge base. But quite frankly, Everybody doesn't want to go to a four-year college. I taught art in high school for most of my career, and um, I coached my seniors on their career paths after, after high school. And um, two-year technical schools, going into the world of work, um, I've been talking a lot lately with the trades and the apprentice programs. I think that there are a lot of good options for people to have a good life, and to uh, be able to um, support a family. Zach? Well, first and foremost, and I think that's the fundamental question, you know, we, we need to instill a lifelong love of learning in our children. So even uh, outside of the classroom, uh, they can continue to educate themselves. Uh, we've got a lot of resources and technology available, and we need to encourage that at all, at all uh, levels in all areas. Uh, but I think we need to expand uh, career technical education traditionally known as you know, vocational training. If, uh, if a student doesn't desire or can't afford to go to a four-year university, uh, we need to give them the opportunities to learn a skill or trade, uh, possibly a, a, in conjunction with a dual enrollment program from a technical college or community school where they can graduate with a certification in a particular skill, whether it be welding, uh, nursing, or web programming, and instantly be hireable by Ohio's employers. Um, secondly, uh, according to the Ohio Board of Regents, 40% approximately of, of high school graduates fail to meet the minimum expectations of our colleges and universities. They've got to take at least one remedial course. This is unacceptable. So if, a, if our child does want to go on to uh, a four-year university, we've got to make sure they're prepared for college. Okay. Um, one of the areas that's out there right now that's very popular, lots of focus going into it, is the whole idea of STEM education, mm -hmm. uh, science, technology, uh, engineering and math. As an art teacher, a 30-year art teacher, yeah. <laughs> how do you feel about the emphasis on STEM and would you have any sort of insight as to what you think the future of Ohio's commitment to that sort of approach to schools is? I think it's on track. I would add the letter A to that and call it STEAM. And, um, and the reason for that is um, I do believe that the arts are a terrific 
venue for students to pull together seemingly unrelated information into new meaning that has relevance for their life. And so you have all the technical stuff. They have an ability then to be able to form connections and network and understand it in a holistic way. Um, there's been some research done with that. The University of Michigan um, took a look at their honors graduates, I think from 1990 to 94, and they found that um, the ones that were uh, writing the most patents and that were the ones that had started their own businesses had eight times the exposure as other citizens in the arts. So I believe that um, a serious and significant immersion in the arts should be part of a comprehensive student's um, okay. education. Zach, what about STEM, STEAM, and there's two, <laughs> two variations. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. both are talked about. Yeah. Both are talked about. Yes. Well, you know, first and foremost, I, I do feel the arts are important for a child's growth and development. Um, and that's one of the reasons I actually want to see cursive you know, taught again in schools because I believe it stimulates the artistic parts of the brain. It's really kind of an art form. And in addition to be able to sign a check and to, to read our founding documents. But, you know, uh, STEM's, STEM is where the emphasis is, but I think we need to put a, a more of an emphasis in history and civics. Um, how can our, our students uh, graduate and then go on to profess their love of country and elect the next generation of leaders uh, if they don't know that each state has two U.S. senators? And uh, we passed, uh, and Governor Kasich signed into law, uh, legislation to beef up those standards. But I, if, if elected, I want to make sure we enforce that. So you feel, and I saw on your website, which was one of the reasons I sort of got to this question, yeah. that you feel... I mean, it's one thing to talk about STEM. Do you feel that civics, or in your case, art is actually being de-emphasized? Because it, mm -hmm. it isn't necessarily that way. I mean, yeah. Pat talked about art. What about, what about in the civics, history, yeah. political science area? Do you feel yeah. it's actually being de-emphasized? Uh, I, I don't know if de-emphasized would be the word, but I think we have to emphasize the right things. Uh, in my personal belief, I feel that some of the history being taught in schools um, is, is a bit distorted and doesn't speak to the great accomplishments of America and the great things we've done uh, for other nations and people around the world. And, and, I, and I also want to hone in on dates. I've talked to many students and, and asked them, uh, can you get me within 50 years of when the Civil War was fought? And, and they struggled to do that. And yet, if you ask them anything that's going on, you know, uh, in, in MTV and some of these reality TV shows, they'll, they'll know. And, and I want to be fair. We have some brilliant, brilliant minds in, in our district and in Ohio. But I do think there needs to be a stronger emphasis on history and civics, especially if these students are going to go on and, and become the leaders to, to solve our problems. Pat, you were in the schools as an active teacher for yeah. 30 years. Uh, what about on the civics history side? I know you didn't teach that, but... Right, but I did a lot of integrated curriculum with my colleagues in that because we do need to continue to make um, a teaching and learning relevant to students so they can see why we're, they're studying what they're studying. And um, I don't know, I, um, I've been deeply involved in um, standards over the years, developing standards in the arts ed, of course, but in talking with my colleagues and, and some of the committees I worked on, um, I feel like that it's, it's comprehensive and, and the, the state standards address um, a comprehensive investigation um, into history, civics. Um, now any given, um, how should I say it, education trend era, some things get de-emphasized and emphasized and uh, we have so much time with students. and. Um, I'm, okay. I'm looking at the, the, the Common Core right now. Well, that's I where mean, I'm going. So, I okay, mean, you're bringing it up. What do you think of the Common Core? Well, I think we've been doing that for a long time in the arts. Um, to me, Common Core is just a more in-depth um, investigation into concepts. Instead of hitting, I think the problem that you're talking about is we've done kind of a shotgun approach to trying to give students a smattering of a lot of things. And um, as my understanding of it, and I'm still talking with teachers and administrators and t parents and that about this, but my understanding of it is it's a more in-depth look at a concept so the teachers can get into looking at comparing things and finding the connection so, so that, uh, I always like to say, so that it sticks. Mm -hmm. Because if you just start to memorize facts, you don't have it in context of anything. 
So, uh, Zach, what do you think about Common Core? Not not yeah. to keep going on sure. the history, or I mean, you and I could talk about mm -hmm. history. Yeah, that yeah. thing. But that's not where yeah, we're going here. Yeah. What about Common Core? Dan, I'm opposed to Common Core, and I support efforts in the Ohio legislature to repeal it. Uh, when it comes to education, I do not believe a federalized, top-down, one-size-fits-all approach is best for our children. Now, I'm not opposed to standards, but in large part, I believe education is the job of the states. Uh, and I want to make sure Ohioans uh, are, are decision makers because they know what's best for Ohio's classrooms, not some bureaucrat in Washington. That's not my understanding of how it got developed. Um, it was uh, across the board, for instance, in the arts. I can, I can speak to that best. We always, when we did the Ohio art standards, art education standards, we always look to the national art education standards uh, for some alignment because, quite honestly, our students are going to live in a global world. Part of living in the 21st century has to be that there has to be a way to have a shared, um, a shared um, knowledge about, about things. The parents, teachers, um, educational uh, specialists in, across the states and in Ohio were, were in, intricately involved in the Common Core. I, it wasn't top down, yeah. I, it's my understanding. Well, I mean, it I, wasn't I, top down. I, I disagree wholeheartedly with that analysis. And furthermore, uh, I am for what I would term as competitive federalism. I, I think it's better for states to have different standards so we can learn what works and what doesn't. The, it's widely agreed upon that the Massachusetts standards are superior than the Ohio or Common Core learning standards. Why should Massachusetts, say, adopt Common Core and have their children take a step back? If elected, everything I do, every action I take, every vote I make is going to put the children first. And I think we can come up with standards that are best for Ohio. So your, your point is you think it's coming from the top down, even though the counter argument is that there are the national standards, but every state is then has to develop its own curriculum, and therefore each state's curriculum is going to be different because it's going to come from the bottom up. So when we get into the differences between standards and curriculum, I want to, and this is, you know, let's have an honest conversation about this. If you set standards and you align assessments or park assessments with these standards, you're going to have to uh, develop curriculum or there's going to be curriculum adopted to teach to these tests because that's how schools and, and teachers are evaluated. So are you, uh, do you think we're doing too much testing? Absolutely. Every parent that I talk to, every teacher that I talk to, uh, and the parades and the, and the interactions I have, they say they spend more time uh, not only teaching to the test, but spending time on test preparation with their students, how to fill in the bubbles, and they are not able to do what they signed up to do, which is be innovative in the classroom and creative and teach students. I'm afraid that teachers are going to leave the profession, good teachers, uh, because we're, we're essentially uh, you know, narrowing what they're able to do in the classroom. Pat, what do you think? Uh, the, 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 the testing, the heavy testing has been going on not just in this administration, right. but it was no child left behind. It's right. been going That's on for some that, time. Yes. So do you feel that this is destructive or disruptive or whatever the right word would be? Well, I absolutely do because we're spending more time, and I would agree with you on that, we're spending more time teaching to tests, which I think brings it down to um, a lower level of standards than what we're trying mm -hmm. to achieve that everybody, all the, all the governors signed on to, uh, Governor Kasich signed on to it, the, um, the, com the business community has signed on to. Um, it is not a mandate, it's a, a framework within then we should be giving teachers the time and resources in order to develop creative ways for students to get at those standards. This is not anything different than I've been doing for 35 years in the classroom, really. I don't, I'm not really sure where, where this, and I've heard this position before um, from folks that believe in this, but, I, but this is not anything different than what we've done. We've had a framework teachers have developed. It, is it possible to... It's the high stakes testing that has taken it out of the teacher's creativity in classroom to assess her individual students. And if, if I may, 
you know, the teachers that I talk to say there's excessive testing. And yes. to me, it's like if I were to measure my height every couple of weeks and somehow to magically expect to get taller, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Some of these tests get shipped away, uh, and you don't even have a chance to sit down with the student and go over what questions they answered right or which ones they missed and why. Not for months. A absolutely. Right. Not for months. And that is that. But what about the evaluation of teachers and the progress of students? Part of this grew out of the feeling by the wider society that we weren't really tracking whether anything was happening. Yeah. I, I started out as a teacher for six years, and you know, gee, I thought I was great, but right. you know, is there a question of measuring that just as it's measured in business? Well, I, you, I absolutely believe that schools and, and teachers should be accountable. Okay. Um, but a test is a snapshot on any given day. Sure. And the, I think the problem becomes that there's been an over-reliance on it, thinking that that is going to benchmark. Let me just twist this a little bit because I'm very aware of time. Does the Ohio Board of Education, if you, one of the two of you will be elected, actually have any ability to lessen the number of tests that are is being administered? Sure. I, um, I would call for a moratorium on high stakes testing for at least three years for the school systems to get this right. This is not something you can drop in one day and the next day. Zach, what do you think? One of the most important roles that I think is overlooked of a State Board of Education member is advocacy. You know, we can talk to the education committees in the House and the Senate. I know a lot of folks up there and have good relationships. We can talk to the Department of Education and tell them what we're hearing from parents and students in our district uh, and get the laws passed or changed that we need to or uh, tweak the rules on how best to implement the laws passed by uh, the legislature. I'm out of time, but I'm going to keep going. i got one more question I want to ask. It's a lot of focus in a lot of places around the country, Denver, Colorado, state of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. who have committed themselves, they believe that it's early childhood education where some real differences can be made. If you're going to increase the investment, you know, 80, 90 percent of all brain development takes place before five, mm -hmm. and that's the place yep. to make the investment, mm -hmm. which is the, the way the State Board of Education is described as K mm -hmm. through 12. Yeah. This is before that. What do you think of how important this is and do you think it would be important for the State Board of Education to expand its vision? And yeah. Zach, let's begin I, with you. You know, I think it needs to be optional. Uh, I, I don't think we, get, we can get carried away here. Um, you know, we have young children uh, uh, here um, and you know, the, the, we're doing assessments for kindergartners at this point, and um, I, I think we need to use common sense in all decisions that are made. Uh, this, this to me, is a legislative issue. Um, I, I'm open to learning more about it, but I think we've got to draw the line and say, you know, really enough is enough. I, I'm not sure that answers the question because I think um, I would be for universal preschool because um, there is a direct correlation between the health and well-being of zero to you know third graders and their ability to um, learn and achieve um, and I, I just firmly believe that we really do need to start there to give them a good chance at success. And if you want to make a difference parental involvement I think is what we need to focus on and how to emphasize that and encourage that from our communities and parents. That's how you make a difference. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. I understand this is the first time you've appeared yeah. together and I hope that between now and election day other people get to hear you. So thank you very much and good luck for, to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to explore more about these two candidates, uh, you can find uh, things at uh, Friends of Pat Bruns. <laughs> Friends of Pat Bruns dot, dot com or at HanesforOhio.com. My eyes just blanked there out. You go. <laughs> Stay tuned after a break. A new organization in the Jewish community to take care of a precious resource. Hey, Thank thanks a lot. Here. Welcome back. Cemeteries are sacred ground. Whether or not you grew up in a particular religious tradition, visiting the graves of relatives and friends is a profound experience. Cemeteries are places that we tell stories about family and community and allow emotions, normally held in check, to well up. 
Yet caring for cemeteries, especially older ones that are no longer active, is a difficult challenge. That's why, unfortunately, most of the time cemeteries make the news, it is because of a cumulative neglect or even vandalism. Since 1821, the Jewish community has established 26 cemeteries in Hamilton and Butler counties. After a careful planning led by Edward Herzig, Michael Ostreicher, and Edward Marks, 22 of those cemeteries came together to form the Jewish Cemeteries of Greater Cincinnati in 2004. On Sunday, October the 12th, the founders will be honored at a celebration at Adith Israel Congregation. I am joined this morning by two people, David Hogay, the uh, executive director of the Jewish Cemeteries of Greater Cincinnati, and Rabbi Gary Zola, the executive director of the Jacob Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives and a professor of American Jewish experience at Hebrew Union College. Gary, welcome back. David, welcome nice to to, uh, uh, to Newsmakers. And so you now have 22 of the Jewish cemeteries under one management, is that correct? And really the driving force with these very practical concerns and issues? I think initially it was a sustainability issue and these three uh, gentlemen that you mentioned uh, got together and said we have to do something about it. Uh, some, some of our cemeteries have repair issues. They're dipping into their endowments. Some of them uh, are defunct congregation cemeteries that are led by volunteers. There's no successors. Mm. Uh, and uh, ultimately, they decided to put all of the cemeteries together in one organization uh, and uh, address the issues that way with some very important funding from the uh, Jewish Foundation to make it all happen. Gary. Why should we care about cemeteries? And why in the Jewish tradition do, should the Jewish community care about cemeteries and Jewish cemeteries specifically? Well, you know that, as you pointed out in, in your fine introduction, cemeteries uh, for all religious traditions uh, uh, you know, connect us from the here to the hereafter. And uh, one of the most important things uh, in Jewish life is uh, remembrance. And uh, so, you know, going back to really biblical stories, our forebears, uh, uh, we, we read stories in the Bible of how our forebears buried their loved ones in caves and in, with, 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 uh, with uh, various ways of preserving their memory. They, the, the monument actually, uh, the, one of the words the rabbis use for a monument in a cemetery is the Hebrew word nefesh, which means soul. So this stone, in a sense, becomes the perpetuation of a memory. It's very important. And then, of course, as you know, Dan, um, cemeteries have a historical value because of all that's written. In fact, uh, one of the earliest, the earliest, I guess, is uh, the one downtown and technically, I guess, the West End uh, on Chestnut Street. We have a photo that we can put up. Um, when, when was this? So this is the oldest cemetery in your group. When was this founded? I was founded in 1821. Um, it uh, was an active cemetery. It's a very small plot of land. For 28 years, it closed in 1849. So it's closed it was, since 1849. There was a cholera epidemic that right. filled it up. Hmm. So even that tells us something about the history of Cincinnati. Yeah, and in fact, that cemetery that you're speaking about is not just the oldest Jewish cemetery in Cincinnati. It is the oldest Jewish cemetery west of the Alleghenies. What does that tell you about the congregation that founded that cemetery? Well, it actually, what one of the interesting points, Dan, is believe it or not, very often in American Jewish history, uh, the cemetery, the establishment of a cemetery is the beginning of Jewish life and this is how it simply works. These pioneers, Jewish pioneers, they are far away from a Jewish community. They have no connection to Jewish life. They're off in Cincinnati in a frontier uh, land. Somebody passes away, maybe unexpectedly. Now they have to buy sacred land. This is what happened in 1821. And now that they've had sacred land, of course, you have to say the prayers over the deceased. So these people have to gather whoever is in the vicinity, and then it, it happens naturally. You say, well, gee, we got together to say the prayers for poor David, you know, or poor Fred, or whatever it is, and we've been doing this regularly. Maybe we should have high holy day services. And 
we, we know from the records that's just what happened here, and it's happened uh, uh, many, many times in America. Uh, it's the common way of doing things. We're almost out of time, but David, is this new structure, it's 10 years old, is it working? Has it got a future? It's working. Um, we've, uh, we're operating uh, at, at a better level than the consultants that were hired. Uh, projected that we would. That's good. Uh, we bought <laughs> land for a new cemetery. The foundation helped finance that. Uh, and uh, I, I think and where is that? It's in Loveland. And that again tells us the trajectory. Of one of the things that I find fascinating is there's so many Jewish cemeteries on the west side. Right. Which reminds Price people help. about the origins in the west end exactly. and then to the west side. So I'm out of time. I want to make sure people know about this celebration. If you're interested in learning more about uh, attending the celebration of the founders, it will be Sunday, October the 12th at Adath Israel Congregation on Galbraith Road from 5 till 7 in the evening. For more information, check the website, J-C-E-M, J-C-E-M, sin, C-I-N dot org. Thank you for being here this thank morning. You, thank you for thank your you. work. Thanks. And always thank you for adding another story. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> thank you for making Newsmakers part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week. Have a good week.